From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Well, good Sunday afternoon and welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Juliana Mazza. For the past few weeks, we've been hearing a lot about a relatively unknown virus in the United States, the Zika virus. It's spreading and fast here in the U.S. and across the globe. The World Health Organization said within the next four years, up to a million people could be infected. Today, we're going to explain exactly what the Zika virus is, who is most at risk, and what you need to look out for. Joining me now is Dr. Karen Ferroni, the medical director at Holyoke Medical Center and a doctor specializing in maternal fetal medicine. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So the first question, what is the Zika virus? So the Zika virus is a mosquito-borne illness. It first came to our attention about 2007 uh, in Polynesia. But it's been moving out of the tropics and subtropics, and it's, it's kind of heading north. And um, it's certainly been spreading in the last few years. And we've been hearing a lot about this moving into the United States. It didn't originate in the U.S., though, correct? No, it, it did not. It, in, it originated in the tropical areas. And it's spread by a mosquito called the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which really is from Africa. But this mosquito has been making its way out of Africa and into the tropical and subtropical regions. And um, it, it is not a mosquito that thrives very well in colder climates. So its ability to spread into the United States will probably be limited by um, the weather conditions here on this continent. Okay, now what are the symptoms of the Zika virus? So they're very mild. Um, about four out of five people don't have any symptoms at all. Uh, those that have symptoms have um, a low-grade fever, some achy joints, perhaps some redness in their eyes. Okay, so does that make it relatively hard to detect then? Well, um, the, it means that you may have the illness and not have any idea that you've, you've caught that virus. Okay, so now how is it spread? So it's spread through the bite of a mosquito. The mosquito bites an infected person and then bites another individual and the virus can travel from person to person in that way. Okay, now recently there was a case out in Texas where doctors had said that they believe the Zika virus was transmitted through sexual contact. Um, you know, are you aware of this? Does this sound like it's plausible? It, it is. It sounds like there is some evidence that's pretty compelling that this might be a way for the virus to spread, perhaps not the most common way, uh, but it appears that the virus might survive for some time in semen. And now, Traditionally, we had thought that this was only spread through mosquitoes. So if it can be spread through sexual transmission, uh, what exactly does that, that mean? Well, it, it means that um, if, if a woman who's pregnant has a partner who may have traveled to an area endemic for Zika virus and contracted the virus, that he could potentially pass that along to his pregnant partner. Okay. And ex exponentially, I mean, this would be able to spread a lot quicker as well. Well, it, it's certainly possible that this could increase the ways that the virus would spread. Okay. And, you know, we hear a lot about this disease affecting pregnant women. What are the risks for pregnant women? Why are they so at risk? Well, it seems that the virus has the ability to um, cross from the mother to the baby. And we have some pretty strong circumstantial evidence that the virus seems to be implicated in some very severe birth defects. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about microcephaly. That's a condition where the baby's brain doesn't develop properly and the head is very small and the brain is very small. Um, those children have very serious consequences to that birth defect. Um, so we feel that for some reason, the fetus may be vulnerable to this infection in ways that adults aren't. Okay, and now in terms of pregnancy, does it matter what stage you're in? Is that something that we've even been able to narrow down at this point? Right now we're really not sure um, which time in the pregnancy is the most vulnerable. We aren't sure even if a virus that you contact later in pregnancy might not have some effects on the fetus, perhaps milder. Uh, there's so much information we still haven't been able to get a hold of. Um, I know researchers are working fast and furiously to try and give us some more information so we can guide 
women and the public as to what to expect with this virus. Is that maybe what makes this just a, a little scarier is the fact that there isn't as much research out there that maybe doctors would like? I think it makes it difficult for those of us taking care of patients, you know, to help counsel them. And the CDC is providing us with as much information as they can, but the reality is that right now, um, if a woman has traveled to that part of the world and is pregnant and there's a question that she might have had a viral illness, um, there's not a lot we can, can do to tell her what to expect. We have to just watch that pregnancy and, and hope for the best. And now, when it comes to traveling, what do you recommend to people who maybe are traveling to some of these areas that are impacted? And what are some of the areas right now that are most impacted? Uh, so it's South America, uh, Mexico, um, uh, some of the Polynesian areas, some of the Southeast Asian areas. So think of warm, humid, tropical areas, the kinds of places we really like to go on vacation. So that can be tough for a lot of people. I know that there are some cruise lines, airlines that have been offering refunds even to people uh, who are nervous to travel. Well, I'm sure that there's a whole group of, of young people who are now nervous about traveling to those parts of the world because of this virus. Now, if you do have something planned, and let's say you, you can't get your money back and you decide that you do want to take the risk, is there anything that you can do to protect yourself? I think this is one of the most important things that we can, we can get out to the public, that, that there is no way that you can completely protect yourself from being bitten by these mosquitoes if you're in an area where this disease is common. So protective clothing, um, mosquito repellent, staying out, uh, when, out, not being outside during dusk and dawn when the mosquitoes are particularly voracious. Um, may be helpful, but it won't necessarily prevent you from being bitten. So the best advice, if you are at risk, and at risk means you are pregnant or you're planning a pregnancy in the near future, you should not travel to those areas. Okay. And now, currently, there is no vaccine for the Zika virus. Coming up, we'll explain what that means for those who are infected, including one Massachusetts resident. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we are talking about the Zika virus. Currently, there is no vaccine to prevent it. Now, here to help explain this disease is Dr. Karen Ferroni and Dr. Amy Jowerick of Holyoke Medical Center. So, Dr. Ferroni is the medical director. She specializes in fetal maternal medicine. Dr. Jowerick specializes in infectious diseases. So, the CDC has said right now there is no vaccine. So, is there any type of treatment? That's right, there's no vaccine and right now there's no treatment except for supportive measures such as fluids, Tylenol, and comfort measures. So is there anything that people can do once you, you are infected? Uh, what you can do is try to help others not get infected. So if you're living in a tropical area, you should try to protect yourself from mosquito bites. The mosquito can't bite you and then bite someone else. And actually for fever control, Tylenol is preferable because it's easier to use uh, for the patients who may have problems with bleeding if they're co-infected with dengue or other viruses that the mosquito also carries. Okay, and you talked about protecting yourself. Um, would you just do that the same basic way that we'd protect ourselves from mosquitoes here in the summer? Right, D and any of the other approved products are fine, even in pregnancy. Okay. Um, and how does someone go about being diagnosed? I know we talked about some of the symptoms earlier on in the program, and they seem that they could kind of fit with multiple other symptoms and, and conditions. So how do you go about determining if someone actually does have the Zika virus? Right now, the only test is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has a test. So the patient would have blood drawn, and a serology would be sent down there to okay. the CDC. Okay. How long does that process take? It can take several days to a week or more. And they also will check for, they may check for chikungunya and dengue fever too, which are masqueraders of this virus. And what, are, can you explain what those other two diseases mm -hmm. are for me? Those are two other tropical diseases that have similar symptoms with sore bones, body aches, fever. Dengue may have some bleeding with it associated, rectal bleeding or urinary bleeding. And chikungunya is very similar to Zika as well with body aches and fever. So it's just important that if maybe someone does suspect that they have travel, maybe they have this just to make sure they get tested. Is that the first thing that, 
that someone should do? Um, that is that will possibly the be the first thing later on, but since it takes such a long time to get tested and the test is not readily available, most people just use symptomatic measures such as Tylenol and then try to prevent mosquito bites if you're still in the tropical area. Okay. As you might imagine, the CDC has been inundated with requests for testing. So right now they are prioritizing blood that comes from women who are pregnant and have a travel history or an exposure history. Um, and even though the test may take four to seven days to, to do, it may take a month or more before the CDC can get results back because of the backlog of tests that they have pending. Okay, so would you recommend, because that can take so long, for anyone who may suspect that they may be infected, we were talking about sexual transmission being a possibility mm -hmm. earlier in the show, would, what would be the recommendation then for these people who are, are waiting and they might have a partner? I would make sure you use protective measures, such as condoms, and try not to get infected in that way. So currently the recommendation would be that if if you are pregnant and have traveled and had an illness, um, if your partner has traveled to those areas and had an illness, you might want to seek advice from your obstetrician. And um, the Department of Public Health here in Massachusetts is helping um, our physicians to, um, to get a sense of how at risk the patient might be. Um, and then blood testing may be indicated. The CDC is providing guidance in that as to which cases they feel merit testing. But we would certainly recommend that if you're in doubt, check with your doctor. And um, if you think that you might be at risk, then um, using condoms and as the DPH says, you know, appropriately using those uh, can help prevent the spread from a man who's traveled to that part of the world and it's spreading to his wife who's pregnant. Okay, and now when we talked about microcephaly, what is the testing process like for unborn babies? Is there a way to test to see if they might have this disease before they're born? So microcephaly is an abnormality that can be detected on prenatal ultrasound. Um, it, it's the baby's head is small or doesn't grow appropriately, um, but it may take a certain amount of time for that condition to develop enough to be detected. So a single ultrasound exam may not provide complete reassurance. Okay. And now microcephaly, is this something that could create lifelong problems then for, for a child? Yes. So what happens is um, as the brain grows and develops, um, you get those folds that we think of um, like a cauliflower. And in microcephaly, that doesn't happen. The brain remains small and very simple. And that is associated with many developmental delays. They can be very, very serious. Um, some of the children with microcephaly never develop beyond the infantile stage. Okay. And now when we do talk about the Zika virus, you know, there is a, a focus on pregnant women, but this can also affect men as well. Well, the disease is really very mild and, and doesn't cause more than a bit of inconvenience for adults. And as far as we know, children. Right, and only 20% of persons who are actually infected and get antibodies have symptoms. So, so this is really... So people don't even have symptoms and don't know they are uh, infected. So if you don't happen to be pregnant or planning to get pregnant, and you are, you know, a college student on spring break and you decide to travel to one of these areas, mm -hmm. then if you get the Zika virus, you know, it, it would be a minor problem. Okay. And, um, you know, something else that I think we should talk about as well is that if you do test positive, what's next? So right now we're only going to be testing pregnant women who are at risk. So if a pregnant woman tested positive for the virus, then we would follow her very carefully with ultrasounds but there's no treatment for microcephaly. So what we would hope is that we could provide her with some reassurance that the baby was growing well and normally um, until the baby was born and further testing could be done. Okay. Now, as we have mentioned, the Zika virus is especially dangerous to pregnant women and their unborn babies. We'll have an in-depth look at women's health in just a few minutes. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
You are watching 22 News in Focus. Today we are talking about Zika virus. We are back with Dr. Karen Ferroni and Dr. Amy Jowrick from Hoyoke Medical Center. So right now it's winter time. So we don't see a lot of mosquitoes up here right now in Massachusetts. But as time goes on, is this something that we think could be more prevalent here in the U.S.? Generally, I think the mosquitoes prefer the southern climates, but actually in Florida, Texas, and some of the states where tropical diseases are can spread, I believe that may be spread within the United States, among the southern states and the Gulf states, because Mexico is very close and it's already spreading there. But I don't expect any epidemics. I expect that persons will seek medical care, protect themselves with DEET, and hopefully there won't be too much of a problem here in the U.S. So, so I mean, specifically for Massachusetts, when we look at us mm -hmm. up here, I mean, it mm -hmm. would probably be even more difficult for us to see an epidemic up in our region. Right, right. We don't think right now the mosquitoes up here will be transmitting the virus, so hopefully that will stay that way. Okay. And, um, you know, we did talk about it being winter up here and, and the mosquitoes, but, you know, like we said, down south right now, I mean, the climate can be very similar. What areas in the United States right now are seeing a, a big influx of these mosquitoes coming in, if any? They're checking in Florida. They're actually checking to see if some of the mosquitoes carry the virus. Uh, Louisiana, Texas would be other prime candidates for that type of spread within the United States. Okay. As far as we know, none of those mosquitoes have tested positive for this virus, but they do have the potential to carry it. So I know that the, um, the CDC and, and our health organizations will be watching very carefully. And of course, trying to eradicate mosquitoes will be a, a big focus as well, I think, come summer. So do you think, I mean, how exactly do you think that we could go about doing something like that? Is this something that we've really ever seen before? We've actually had malaria in the United States before many, many decades ago, and um, mosquito control is part of the efforts and uh, managing wetlands is part of the efforts. So I think it'll be some up to the environmental management people to try to work on that, reducing mosquito habitats. You can do things yourself uh, at home, dumping out buckets full of standing water, which can be mosquito breeding grounds. And now the WHO predicted that up to 4 million people could become infected. Does that sound plausible? Definitely. With the larger ep epidemics, as we've seen with Ebola, with fewer numbers, there is still po possibility for spread. And you, you mentioned Ebola. I mean, several news outlets have compared this to Ebola. Is that a, a fair comparison when we talk about uh, maybe just in the transmission mm -hmm. sense? Well, I, uh, the problem with Ebola is, is mm -hmm. that it has such a high fatality rate. And I think we don't want to alarm people. Zika does not have a high right, fatality right. rate. Quite the opposite. It's a very mild disease. Uh, the reason that I think we want to pay attention to this is because of the concerns regarding pregnancy and the developing fetus, which, you know, Ebola, um, it, it attacks everyone indiscriminately, serious, right? where this virus seems to cause a, a, a bad illness only for the fetus, as far as we know right now. Right. So right. Um, I, I think it, it really isn't, it isn't in the same ballpark as Ebola by any means. Mm -hmm. And There's uh, no fear that it'll mutate or anything that I've heard no. either. So okay. that's reassuring, hopefully. And now for pregnant women who may be struggling right now, um, who maybe have tested positive, um, this can obviously be a very trying time for them, trying to wait. Because like you said, this mm -hmm. process can take a while to, to, mm -hmm. to find out exactly what's going to happen. A lot of unknowns. So un unfortunately, women who find themselves in that situation, um, it 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 will be an anxious time for them. And as the physicians caring for them, you know, it's our job to do what we can to reassure them when we can that, that things are going well. Um, but certainly for um, the, the women in areas like Brazil where the infection has been so common, mm -hmm. um, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy for that country. There's even been many people who have <clears throat> talked about, when you talk about Brazil, the Olympics, people have been saying they don't want to go. Um, so that goes to show I me mean, how seriously this is really being taken here, which maybe is a, a good thing. Well, uh, again, I would say, you know, if, if you don't find yourself in one of those high-risk groups, then travel to these areas mm -hmm. is really not, not a concern. 
Um, but we do recommend that women who are pregnant or who are planning a pregnancy and they're saying, you know, in mm -hmm. the next, let's say, year, um, that, that they avoid that, that kind of travel. So those folks maybe should watch the Olympics on their TV. <laughs> and now, uh, when we do talk about microcephaly, we talk about the effects on, on children. We know that this has been shown to cause uh, smaller heads. Can you explain exactly what that means medically? So what you see when you look at these babies is that their heads are small, but, but the cause of that is that the brain has not grown appropriately. It is, it's very, remains very simple. And so it's the cerebral hemispheres, the part of the brain that allows you to think and reason and, and be the person you are, um, is affected. So these children, you know, can have very serious developmental delays. They may not speak, feed themselves, be able to walk, um, provide any self-care, and they will require 24-7 um, care by their, their parents and caregivers. So th this is a devastating problem for the fetus. And this is something that a parent could potentially, like you said, they, they might have to be able to take care of this child for the remainder of that child's life. Yes. And is, does the lifespan of that child change? Is this something that could limit how long a, a child can live for? Well, I think these children still have the potential to live for many years. Um, it's hard to say that they would have a normal lifespan, perhaps not, but certainly could require many years of care. Okay. Well, thank you both so much. And coming up on 22 News in Focus, we will have the final word. You are watching 22 News in Focus. We have been talking about the Zika virus, a mosquito-borne virus that is prevalent in South and Central America, but has been found here in the United States. Today, we have been joined by Dr. Karen Ferroni and Dr. Amy Jowrick from Holyoke Medical Center. Thank you both so much for being here with us today. And we hope that you have learned something that will help you protect yourself and your family. That is our program for today. We want to thank you, our guests, for joining us. And thanks to you at home for watching. If you miss any of today's program, you can watch it in full on our website at wwlp.com. For all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a wonderful Sunday.